Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode two of the Bait Breakdown presented by the Tackle Talk podcast, a multi-part series where we take an in-depth look at the four major types of a bass's natural forage, bait fish, crawfish, aquatic insects, and reptiles and amphibians. On today's episode, we cover crawfish with special guest, Dr. Zach Loafman. Episode two of the Bait Breakdown starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey, hey, everybody, and welcome back to another very special episode of the Tackle Talk podcast, the second episode of our four-part series, The Bait Breakdown. These four conversations will be brought to you with no ad interruptions after the beginning of the episode, so we do have to give a special thanks to the folks that made this whole series possible. First and foremost, American Legacy Fishing. ALF is the title sponsor of the Tackle Talk podcast for four main reasons. They have an incredible selection of high-quality fishing gear. They have extremely fast shipping times. They have the best prices that you'll find anywhere, and they have hands down the best customer service in the fishing industry. If you are looking for new or used gear, go check out American Legacy Fishing and see for yourself why they have one of the most loyal fan bases in the whole fishing world. If you're looking for anything from G. Loomis, Dobbins, Daiwa, Shimano, 13, Luz, Megabass, so much more, go check out www.americanlegacyfishing.com. I cannot tell you how cool it is to get your guys' messages of your positive experiences with ALF, of everything that you guys have done over the past couple weeks and months. You've ordered from them for the first time. You've had great experiences, and that's really cool to hear. So I appreciate you guys going over and supporting them. You will not be disappointed. They are, hands down, the best retailer to deal with on the entire internet when it comes to fishing gear. So go over and check them out, www.americanlegacyfishing.com. Thank you to the good folks at ALF for making this series possible. We also owe a big thank you to the boys over at Dark Horse Tackle. Dark Horse Tackle is, in my humble opinion, the coolest tackle subscription box out there right now. Like many of the other subscription boxes, Dark Horse Tackle is going to send baits right to your doorstep each and every month, but that's where the comparison ends. That's where the similarities kind of stop between Dark Horse Tackle and all those other competitors. Those other competitors are going to send you cheap kind of knockoff Chinese lures, in-house brands, trial packs, stuff like that. You are not getting that with Dark Horse Tackle. Dark Horse Tackle is going to send you handmade Custom run USA May lures from companies that you've probably never heard of, but are right here in the United States. It could be someone making, you know, jigs in North Dakota. It could be someone making soft plastics in Oklahoma, hand carved, you know, balsa crankbaits or something in Georgia. Really cool stuff. So if you like supporting small American tackle companies and trying new lures, I encourage you to go check out Dark Horse Tackle. Dot com. Click subscribe when you go to darkhorsetackle.com. You'll see the different options there. Use code TACKLETALK30. TACKLETALK30. At checkout, you will save 30% off your first month's box just for listening to the show. Thank you again to the boys over at Dark Horse Tackle for making this possible as well. All right, so let's get into today's episode. Last week, we covered anything and everything bait fish with Shane O'Gorman. So bait fish has been checked off the list here, and today we are moving forward to crawfish. And we are fortunate enough to have one of the crawfish guys in the country, Dr. Zach Loafman. So we talked to Dr. Loafman about craw behaviors, about habitat, colors, mating, movements, species, a ton more. So as always, this series is all about understanding the bait, understanding the natural forage of the fish that we spend so much time targeting. So let's get into it. I had a ton of fun making this episode. Dr. Loafman is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to crawls. I hope you guys enjoy it. Here is our conversation with Dr. Zach Loafman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by Dr. Zach Loafman of West Liberty University, biology professor. We are going to talk crawfish today. Zach, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for contacting me. I'll talk about crawdads with anybody. 
<laughs> we we always joke we're the same way about fishing. Like I'll talk to a brick mm-hmm. wall about fishing if I want to. So yeah. Um. So this is obviously one of our four part series of the bait breakdown. Um. And your field of expertise is obviously crawfish. So before we get into the nitty gritty of uh kind of the ins and outs of everything crayfish, do you want to hit us with your background on how you got into this? How you kind of became, uh, I guess, the crawfish guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I can do that. So my entire life, I've been a nature nerd uh, and spent a lot of time fishing myself. So, uh, you know, I, I know the angle that the podcast is coming from. But uh, I decided very early on that I wanted to actually make zoology my career. And when I, I, I had parents that supported everything I did, and basically we figured out that it was best for me to pursue academia. And so I went to West Liberty University where I currently am a professor and had a wonderful um, advisor there and got my degree in biology. And he, and the guy's name was Mr. Gordon and Gordon basically let me go nuts. Uh, At the time I wanted to be a herpetologist, which is reptiles and amphibians. And I don't know if your audience can see, but you know, here in the office with me, if you're wondering what's in those tanks, geckos and snakes and stuff like that. So, uh, I uh, didn't turn my back on herpetology, but I, I got my undergrad with Marshall. And when I was at Marshall University, I was studying reptiles and amphibians, and it became very apparent that there were a lot of other people studying reptiles and amphibians. And getting a job as a herpetologist is going to be very cutthroat, difficult to do. Uh, and my advisor at Marshall, Dr. Tom Polly, basically told me, hey, I watch you pick an animal group that nobody else works with. Find something that you can be passionate about with them and then be the guy. And I dabbled with a whole bunch of different groups, but I kind of serendipitously ended up with crayfish and they fit the bill for me perfectly. All my training with uh, reptiles and amphibians, you know, small vertebrates was directly applicable to a large invertebrate. Uh, and then I, I found out that there was literally nothing known about these things uh, as far as their natural history and ecology was concerned. And that's what I needed. And so it fit that bill. And we'll leave the story at that. But that was all the way back in 2004. And uh, I haven't turned turned my back on that. And I ultimately got my PhD at Indiana State. My dissertation was on the crayfishes of West Virginia. So I described new species of crayfish. I've studied them where we put radio transmitters on them and tracked them through the creek to kind of understand what a day in the life of a crawdad is. Uh, We've been all, my lab and I have been all over the country uh, pretty much. Everywhere but the middle and upper Midwest, we've done the East Texas, Georgia, the Carolinas, Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, um, Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, like basically all those places studying crawdads and catching crawdads. And the best thing is, you know, most fishermen and outdoorsmen, when they're little, catching craws is what you do. Like when you're 10 or 8, you go to the creek. That's what what you're you're flipping rocks and catching these things. And it's crazy right. that I get paid to do that. <laughs> anyway, I can't complain. So that's my background. Um, and it was the best decision I could have made because uh, I love them to death. They're really interesting animals. So uh, a little bit of a humble brag here, too. I read this. I don't know if it's up to date or if it's right or not. But when I was uh, figuring out who I wanted to reach out to for this segment, it said that you had discovered and named, I think it was like 10 crayfish species over your career. Is that true? Yeah. One of the... We're up to 15 now, um, and within the next five years, that's going to double. That's not really, though, to to be humble about it. Since there's so few of us that actually have dedicated our professional careers to crayfish biology, when you don't have a lot of people studying a group, things go unnoticed. And one of the the nutty things that I don't think the anglers listening to this realize is, A, one of the questions, you know, when I tell people I study crayfish diversity, a lot of the times what the, what I get is like, there's more than one? I'm like, yeah, there's more than one crawdad. There's about 400 species in North America alone. We have a project right now where when we're done, if we're able to publish all the different new species, it'll end up being just from this one project, we're going to have over a dozen new species described. And these are great. And when we say new species, a lot of times people get kind of like, Prickly, because you know, I I described a species of crayfish that lives in the mountains of West Virginia that's blue. And anyone that's grown up in West by God knows about this blue crayfish. You go up to a place <laughs> called Dolly Sods or Cranberry Wilderness, you're gonna find it. And I got a lot of you know, when it was 
published in social media, a lot of people are like, that's not new. I've known about that my whole life. And that's absolutely true. What it is, is it's undescribed. That crayfish up in the mountains was masquerading underneath one scientific name. And the reality of it was it's a completely different species. So a lot of these things anglers have been aware of much longer than the scientific community <laughs> has. So, you know, we all have our, our role to play uh, and, and fishermen absolutely have contributed in that regard. Well, either way, like even like you said, even if it's just a, you know, uh, yeah, a technicality almost on some of this yeah. stuff, it's like it's still cool that you you technically changed the way that from here on out science will look at a certain thing. Like, I, I don't know. There's just a, a big picture of that that's kind of cool. That's going to be like, OK, it was maybe un uh, misunderstood or not understood well enough. And you, you know, yeah. you helped create that. That's kind of cool. Um, so obviously you've studied, you've identified, you've discovered, you've named all this kind of stuff. I would safe to say that you're probably qualified for this conversation we're about yeah. to have from my level. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm very, very excited. So, uh, basically this series, I know I talked about uh, this before we started recording, but we are trying to really learn the small nuances and the ins and outs of these things that we spend so much time trying to imitate. It seems silly mm -hmm. that, you know, I can tell you all this stuff about bass's behavior, but I know almost nothing about craw behavior. And I spend my entire day, eight hours imitating a crawl and I don't know anything about it. So, uh, let's start with habitat. Habitat, I think is, is something that interests me. Can you walk us through, I guess, the basics of where crawls are going to be found in terms of maybe bottom composition, cover, current? Is there anything like that that helps determine where in a body of water crawls are going to be found more than others? Yes. And when you, when you talk about crawls, we're, we're not going to get too technical, but if you're, if you're from a fisherman's point of view, if you're fishing a lake, the crayfish that live in that lake are going to be in a different habitat than if you're fishing in a, in a river. So if you're going after okay. smallies in the new river, the crayfish there, which I can also tell you that's the main forage of those fish is crawdad. Um, yeah. They're going to be living in a very different habitat than if you're going for largemouth in a lake with aquatic plants. So yeah. if you're in a, a stream or a river, the crayfish are going to be in any kind of situation that has, just like the fish, abundant cover. Uh, and for them, what we're talking about are uh, rocks. And not all rocks are created equal. Uh, any kind of what, what, what I would refer to as a slab rock. So slab rocks are rocks that are kind of... Uh, they're, they're flat, they're not rounded. And oftentimes when you get into a river, uh, they'll, they'll kind of stack on top of each other. When they stack on top of each other, you get what we call an interstitial space, which is that space in between the rocks where it's open. And that is basically like the hotel or the condo you know, unit for crayfish. And so those interstitial spaces are absolutely critical. So if you've got a situation where you've got a lot of crevices and little, um, cavities you're going to get crayfish in there and when it comes to streams here in eastern north america outside of the ozarks uh you, you have two groups of crayfish and one of those is uh, it's you know we're gonna get a little technical they're they're common names sometimes they're referred to as spiny crayfishes their genus name is factonias and most rapalas and lures that you're going to be you know casting when i go into Bass Pro, and I look at the the lures, I look at it, and go, oh, that's a fact of you know, Everybody else is like, it's crayfish. <laughs> but anyway, and these crayfishes are, if you look at like the total amount of crayfish in a unit area in a stream, most of the time they're going to make up 60 to 70% of the population of crayfish uh, in a stream. It's a little different when you're in rivers that drain straight into the Atlantic Ocean because they're you have this other genus, Tamberis, but they fill that same niche that the Faxonias are filling. Uh, but those animals are usually what fish are feeding on if they're a bass, which is going to be an active site predator. Um, and then if the river's clean, those animals reach insane density. So if you've ever been in a stream or river and you're, you watch the crayfish just kicking out in every direction, those are almost certainly members of that genus. And okay. those crayfishes are gregarious. They aren't territorial or as territorial. So they'll live together. Um, and that's how they're able to reach those really high uh, densities. The other thing that's really cool about Faxonai is, is it, and you've got a bunch of leaf, uh, leaf pack in the bottom of the pool. You may not know it, but that leaf pack is probably infested with crayfish. 
And I've done a lot of work collecting crayfishes where we put on snorkels and are basically crawling up the creek in about three feet of water because it's much easier to catch crayfish in those situations. And what's really fun when you do that is small mouths will actually learn what you're doing very quickly, uh, especially when you're flipping rocks and there's crayfish you know, zooming out. And they'll actually like hang two feet to the left to two feet to the right. <laughs> and they, it's almost like a race between me and the damn smallie to get the crayfish before they do. Uh, but when they, when they do that, I, I've gotten to watch them a lot. And, and we'll get into a leaf pack situation in a, in a, in a pool and you just kind of stop and watch. And the small, small owls will actually hang out about a foot or two above that leaf pack. And you watch them and they'll swim up the leaf pack and then they'll turn around real quick and swim back. And their presence will startle the crayfish that are in that leaf pack. And they'll just zap them as they're moving around. And so in that situation, if you were to put a, you know, put some kind of lure through there that imitates crawdad, you're almost certainly going to catch you know, those animals because they have this behavior to basically, for lack of a better word, spook the crayfish in activity so they can get them. If you're in a lake, very different situation. If you have any kind of rocks in a lake, that's where the crayfish are going to be. But a lot of times you don't. You have a mud bottom or a sand bottom, still bottom. And in that situation, especially if you're in the southeast, you're dealing with a whole different genre of crayfish. Procambrus is that genus. That's the genera that you eat if you go to New Orleans. Um, so all the bayous of Texas and Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and most of Florida, that's the dominant genera. And those crayfishes are going to be on the bottom in shallow water, anywhere you got a lot of leaf or sorry, uh, vegetation build up. Um, so if you've got lily pads or uh, foxtail, coontail, whatever you want to call it, um, just veg, they'll be down in that. And they will do pretty much the same thing that the stream crayfish will do in leaf pack. So kind of a weighted question, where are the crayfish? Uh, yeah. It really depends on what you're fishing as to where they're going to be. So in a, you said something interesting there. So in a lake situation where you do have a deep lake and you said most of those crawls are going to be, mm -hmm. you know, in the shallower water, which makes sense. That's where you see most of them. But then as anglers, we're out there dragging a giant crawl imitation football jig off of a 20 foot deep point. Are there crawls there too, or are they so concentrated up up shallow that it's just like those fish down there know that, you know, their instincts say to eat a crawl. There's one out of place, an easy one, they're going to eat it. Or are there crawls down on those real big, deep rock points as well? There can, there can totally be crawls that crayfish down there. Uh, they will be anywhere there's rocks. So if you've got okay. the, the slab rocks on top of slab rocks on top of slab rocks in 20 feet of water, there will be crayfish down there. Uh, okay. But if you've got a mud bottom, in 20 feet of water they will if it's a compacted mud bottom they will actually dig burrows down into that mud and, and live down in there but they don't like that they much they would much rather have a slab rock substrate so like lake erie is a great example if you go diving in 20 feet of water uh and you've got a, that limestone that's kind of indicative of the erie basin there, there will absolutely be crayfish down there but if you go out onto the like flat of Lake Erie where there's no rock strata at all, much more difficult to find them out there. What about current? What does current do to them? Because I seem to see a lot of them, and obviously you see a bunch of them in creek and river situations, so that's where they're most yeah. dense and where I see them anyway, but is there any certain pattern to uh, more dense or less dense when there's current or less current? Yes. Most crayfishes in a, in a river or stream situation, they like what we call a run. So basically... They want there to be flow, but they don't want it to be torrential. So if you're in, uh, like I was just in a stream all afternoon today, imagine that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we were catching crayfish left, right, and center. And where the water velocity wasn't what we would call a ripple, but it wasn't a pool either, that kind of intermediate run, that's where the crayfish went. Um, now, there are plenty of species, though, that have specialized for living in that high velocity water and in that situation they will not be exposed because not only do they have to deal with predators if they're out and about moving around but they also have to deal with the fact that the water is moving fast and they have a hard time holding station so a lot right. of species of crayfish have this really cool adaptation where if they're going to live in high velocity water when they um pitch their claws together there is actually a great big gap or chasm 
And what these crayfishes do is they walk up the stream facing directly up current and they hold their claws at different angles and the water actually goes through that hole in their claw and they can tweak their claw and it, bend, it bends the water, moves the water so it goes up over their head and then straight down onto their back. So it literally pins them to the bottom of the river. And so they're able to walk up through that riffle and not go like flying downstream. And that's how they're able to exist there. That's so they make but themselves they, as aerodynamic will, as possible they, and just hug the bottom. Exactly. There is exactly there. there and, and that's the thing. Like when people say there's more than one crawdad and I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, there's 20 species that have this one adaptation. Um, yeah. It, 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 that's what makes them so interesting to a scientist like me is that they really do change their shape and form in response to the environments that they're living. So let's move to species. You you touched on species a little bit. This is a part of craws that obviously I know zero about. I'm the dummy that looks at it and goes, yep, that's a crawfish. Like it's that's about the extent of my knowledge. But um, are there very different craws in, say, like you're in West Virginia right now. So say yep. you're in West Virginia and say there's someone listening to this right now that's in Oregon. What percentage of those craws cross over and are fairly similar? And what percentage of those are like nowhere near the same? So if you're, it's funny you picked Oregon. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, so like basically mid California up into British Columbia, Vancouver, uh, those are actually the crayfish that live out there that are native. And, and we'll get into invasive and native species on certainly yeah. here in a minute. Those crayfishes are completely different than our crayfishes that are over here east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they're in a totally different family. They can get to be larger. They live in water that's much colder um, as a general rule. Uh, and they have a coloration that's very unique to them. They're usually just a brown color to an orange brown color. And there's one species out there called the signal crayfish that has this white dot on its claws uh, that's very enigmatic. And it's like the classic Pacific Northwest crayfish. When you come over here through the Rocky Mountains, there's a couple species that live there, but you don't get that much diversity there. And then when you drop down into like the plains, in the southeastern U.S. and you know the Midwest, the Northeast, so, uh, Ontario, Canada, that that's where that epicenter of diversity is. And basically, there are a handful of of, of uh, places that have their that have a unique crayfish fauna. So if you're in what we would call the Gulf Coast, um, the coastal plain across from East Texas through all the way over to Florida, that's going to have a fauna that is basically going to be composed of that genus Procambris. And most of those crayfishes, not all, but most of those are going to be a reddish brown, a red color. Uh, there's one very prevalent uh, species group that is basically that red swamp crayfish. That's the guy you eat. Um, that's, that's where the red crayfish idea comes from. Uh, when you move your way north from the Gulf, you get into the Ozarks. The Ozarks and the Ojeda Mountains have their own fauna, and their fauna of crayfishes is based primarily on this genus Faxinia. And those are those crayfishes that reach real high densities, and um, they can be quite colorful, uh, and then others are just brown. Uh, and, and it's thought that they, one of the ways they tell each other apart is through chemistry and signaling. So contrast is super important for that, that, those animals. And then when you make your way over into the Appalachians and the Midwest uh, and the Northeast and then the Atlantic Slope, so basically um, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and, and parts of Georgia, that's a, that, the genus that's there is this genus Camberis. And those animals are the kind of big, bad crayfish. You know, if, if you catch a crawdad and you're like, oh, my God, it's a lobster – and you're in that part of the world, you're almost certainly collecting a Camberis unless you have an invasive. Uh, and those animals are, are, are different as well. And, you know, a lot of people might be like, oh, well, you know, who cares? A crawdad is a crawdad. I can flat out tell you as the crayfish biologist who has literally flipped hundreds of thousands of rocks in the past decade and a half. A lot of times we catch the crayfish, we release them. And the way that the fish respond when the crayfish hit the water a lot of times, like here in, in Appalachia, they'll go after a Camberis, that big burly guy, and then it's almost like they realize, oh, it's you. I don't want to I don't want to mess with you because you can defend yourself. And then they'll yeah. stop pursuing that animal, and then they'll see a fast and and they're like, oh, I can pound you. And the next thing you know, you know, all those guys are just getting obliterated. So if you're a fisherman 
and you're fishing a pattern that's indicative of Cambaris, they're not going to bite it. Whereas if you throw out that Baxanias pattern, they're going to be all over it. And so that's why a little bit of biology, I think, goes a long way as far as angling is concerned. And I work, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot remember the guy's name, but I worked with a guy out of the Pacific Northwest who was, um, was making lures and he was hand painting these lures and he really wanted to know what species were what up there because he said like i just caught a crawdad and i imitated the pattern and i was able to catch fish after fish after fish with this pattern and then i had another pattern and all i left off was that white dot and none of them would touch it and so you know that to me was the, the best evidence ever of that pattern does matter um but then again you're also going to have a bass that's just going to eat whatever the hell is in front of it because they do that too so to dumb bass guy right here, you just described, obviously, the I think you said the Canberras, the one that can defend itself, the little bit yeah. burlier one. Mm -hmm. um, what are for us the indicative traits of that where you're saying if I'm holding up two jigs or two craws, what's the difference to to me, simpleton of like, this is the one they want. This is the one they're scared of. That's super simple. The overall body plan of the jig is what matters. So that 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 group that the bass are eating. Their body plan is very uh, sleek in aerodynamics, not aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, okay? Whereas these other guys are these big, burly uh, animals that you look at and you're like, okay, that thing can put up a fight. And that's basically it. Um, and I've, like I said, I've watched these things underwater and, and they can. Um, I've totally watched them. Like you let it go and you got that erratic movement of the crayfish when it's released. And that will draw the fish in and they'll chase it. And then that crayfish hits the bottom of the creek and is able to like do its defensive posture. And as soon as it does that posture, the bass realizes, oh, it's you. It's almost like it was attracted to the movement, but then it realized, ah, it's that one. And then it just kind of swims off. So they're, they're definitely queuing into that. So it sounds like it's just kind of overall size. Uh, you know, when we talk about like bulking up a jig or something like that, not always uh, a good thing. Yep. Got it. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, too, and I know when we had our very initial conversation a while back, you had mentioned this, and it's something that it was a buzzword that I've always heard. And again, just I don't fish live bait, so I don't uh, know a lot of this stuff. But you hear the old guys around here talk about their soft crawls and you talk yeah. about, you know, these crawls. They seem to be like the the just all oh, the like golden things that old guys <laughs> want to fish with. Like when they're looking for crawls, they're like, I've got soft crawls. They're worth their weight in gold. What is the difference between soft crawl and kind of like regular uh, crawl that's in there? And is there anything that anglers need to know about those two things? Absolutely. So, and, and, and your segue was beautiful because every crayfish has to molt to grow. Okay. And we just got done talking about those Canberras that are these you know, big burly animals and they, they can defend themselves. There is one time in their life when they are completely defenseless. And that is basically immediately after they molt their exoskeleton. And when they do that, they go from being these like little tanks to a pile of goo. And what happens is biologically, they, they, they expel that exoskeleton and they then have to kind of, they have to take calcium carbonate that they have inside of them in this little um, structure that's right off their stomach where they basically hoard calcium carbonate right before they're going to molt they molt and then they start to digest that structure and as they're digesting it that's going to go back into their exoskeleton and harden them up but for about depending on the species it could be as little as 24 hours it can be as long as 72 hours they can't defend themselves at all and they release a chemical during this period of time that fish that are very chemically oriented things like catfish are a great example uh they can smell that sense it and they lose their damn minds when they pick up that scent because they can basically, they know if I can find this thing, it's defenseless and it's probably a large meal, especially if it's one of those great big Canberra. So fish and crayfish have had this predator prey re interaction for literally eons and it gets around this molting. So yes, that is not a wise tale. Uh, it's, there's a lot of truth behind that and, and, and doesn't matter what species of fish it is. They will go eight over a soft shell crayfish. One thing that I have heard a lot of people say is like, well, I went down to the creek and I got a bunch of crayfish and I know how to make a molt. Uh, then you know something that I don't. <laughs> because <laughs> in aquaculture, 
that is a magical thing because aquaculture facilities have tried for eons to figure out how to induce molting because if you could rear these things in mass and have soft shells on soft craws on demand, you're going to make millions of dollars. And when you go to Bass Pro, you can't do that. Uh, so here in you know the Mid Atlantic, the Midwest, our genera of crayfish, they're going to molt in the late spring. They're going to molt this time of year, actually, going into the fall. And that genus Faxonius, they all molt at once. There's like a two-week window of time. And it's a strategy that's identical to what the 17-year the cicadas do. Basically, they know they're going to be weak. So they all molt at once. And then the, the, the fish get fat off the first round of molters. And then they, they basically like, oh, I don't want to eat anymore for a little while. And then that second wave of molters molts. And they're able to make it and survive and reproduce and keep population going. The genus Camberis, they're different. They um, will all molt over a two-month period of time, and they'll go underneath a rock and sequester themselves and you know backfill the burrow, make sure nobody can get to them. So that's what's happening in a creek. If you're in a, a pond, it's a very different situation because those Procambrous crayfishes, they grow very fast, and the molting is related to growth. So there's always going to be some part of the population if the water's warm, molting. Uh, and so if you put in your time, you can almost certainly find, you know, soft shell crayfish in a pond any time of the year. But it's a little bit different when you're up here in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, Appalachia, places like that. Got it. So is there any negative side? I've heard before, obviously, and I think, I, I can't remember if it was you or not, they may have mentioned it before, that sometimes this need for soft craws introduces species of craws into uh, bodies of water that do not need to be there, or if it's just maybe not the soft craws, but it's just yeah. transporting craws in general. Can you touch on just the, because I know there are some invasive species of craw, and I know, especially for someone like you that spends yeah. their whole time studying these, these can be a problem. And to us, again, it's going to go back to dumb bass angler, like it may not seem like a huge deal, but there are repercussions to any sort of invasive species. So can you touch a little bit on, I guess, where we're at in terms of invasive species with craw, how it happens and how we either prevent it or we need to be, I guess, cognizant of it at least? Yes. Uh, th this idea that a crayfish is a crayfish is a crayfish. I understand how it can be frustrating to an angler who doesn't understand crayfish biology. And they're like, well, you know, I, I need bait. Um, I'm going to catch the bait in my local creek here in West Virginia. And I'm going on a fishing trip in North Carolina. And I'm going to take them with me, you know, and get that part of the trip out of the way. But if you introduce certain species of crayfish into other water bodies, it, it can have an insanely deleterious effect on not only the native crayfishes in that watershed, which is what I am out there sampling and surveying, but it can ultimately literally cause a, a, a trophic collapse, uh, which is basically the entire food web can implode if you introduce certain species of crayfish that have certain characteristics associated with their biology. If you introduce a crayfish that breeds a lot, has a lot of young, and can reach sexual maturity really fast, that's a problem. And some examples of those are the red swamp crayfish, which is the one that is in the southeast. I've said that now like three times. Um, another crayfish <laughs> called the rusty crayfish, which is a crayfish that has a big maroon dot on its um, carapace. And then a third one is the virile crayfish, which is this uh, great big, well, it's funny. Where it lives in the Midwest and in the Ozarks, it's actually not that big of a crawdad. But when it's introduced into places like Appalachia, where I live, it actually becomes the largest crayfish you're going to bounce, you're going to, you know, fumble into when you're out looking for these things. And the issue with these animals is multifaceted. One is when you release these animals into the, into the water. So you're done at the end of the day. You got a couple that have survived. You just dump your bait. That's what's called a bait bucket introduction. Uh, those animals, if they're if they've mated, female crayfish maintain a sperm packet, so they don't they aren't spawners. They basically get inseminated, kind of complicated. We're not going to get into that. But you release them, they then produce eggs. You can by releasing that one female release eight hundred crayfish, and you don't realize that. that's how many eggs these things lay, and those 800 crayfish, she may have had many baby daddies associated with that clutch of eggs. So you're releasing a whole bunch of half-brothers, half-sisters, 
which can then breed with each other. And there will be a little bit of inbreeding, but there's really not as much inbreeding as there would be with other animals in this scenario. So you can quite literally, with one crayfish, create an entire population. And what those animals do is the invasives will run around and the little guys eat aquatic plants. And this is really important. If you're in a lake, where do the bass bed? They bass in the macrophyte bed, the plant bed. And things like that viral crayfish, uh, I've studied introductions of viral crayfish where I was on the ground within a year of them being introduced. And I'm talking about a fishery that was loaded with bass because there was a plethora of aquatic plants. Those viral crayfish young ate the plant, and it basically was no different than clear cutting a forest. And when those crayfish became adults, all the plants are gone because they ate all of them. The following year, there's no bass bed. And so you end, so that's why you should, this stuff matters. It's not, you know, a crazy animal lover. You know, jumping up and down, screaming and, and, and doing all kinds of crap. It's legitimate management. Most of my funding comes from uh, people that are in fisheries that are basically like, oh, crap, like this is a problem. And a great example of this is uh, I was doing a project in Virginia and I found a crayfish in the upper James River. And I was like, what the hell are you? I've, I've collected here my whole, you know, for my whole career. I don't know what you are. We actually thought it might have been undescribed, and we, we ended up doing a lot of science. We were able to figure out that this crayfish was actually a crayfish called Saxonia ozarki. It was the Ozarks crayfish. And we did, we went all the way to Arkansas, Missouri, and collected crayfish there and used genetics to pinpoint the point of origin of these crayfish in the Upper James. And it turns out that the genetic fingerprint of our crayfish we were finding in Virginia was identical to the Strawberry River Ozarki, and, and I think that's in Arkansas. And there is a massive trout distributor that comes out of the Strawberry River that was bringing trout from there to the Upper James in Virginia. And basically what they would do is they would throw some crayfish in the tank and the crayfish would eat the dead trout fingerlings as they were driving the truck. And when you, dump, when you open up the, the the truck, everything in the tank goes out into the river. And now I was just, you know, my students were actually back there and they're like, the bottom is crawling with those archie. They're freaking everywhere. And the macrophytes and parts of that river are gone. The smallmouth fishery has gone, even though the not gone, it's not gone. It's definitely been impacted because you can also reach a point where there's too many crayfish for the fish. And where are the fish bedding de bedding? They're bedding on the substrate and they can't keep the craws out of the damn nest so they end up eating the eggs so you know you, you can you can say that uh, there's been plenty of fishermen that get upset when regs come into play about bait but this is one that i actually feel is, is needed and here's this is all you do this is literally needs the secret catch your bait where you're fishing if you go <laughs> there and you get your freaking crawdads out of the lake that you're fishing in a the bass know those crawdads those are the crawdads that they're honed into chemically B, you're not going to introduce anything, so it's not your fault when the whole fishery collapses later on. <laughs> and, and, you know, C, you might actually catch a fish with those crayfish. So that, that's just basically it. But another thing, um, you know, in the crayfish world, we all were having, we were freaking out because last year, I won't name names, but an extremely well-known bass fisherman was, was talking about how he stocks his lakes with crawdads and he drives into New Orleans and buys, 300 pounds of crayfish and then he comes over to texas and then cuts the bottom of these bags open and just dumps them into these ponds and i understand what you're doing there but as a crayfish biologist that is a literal nightmare like yeah <laughs> so that's like watching a a slow moving train wreck where people are dying because you're basically the crayfish that was being introduced is a well-known invasive it's one that's been known to cause all these these problems and it was being introduced in a part of Texas where it's not native. So you can absolutely get into problems. And these things are tough. Uh, there's been studies done where uh, these crayfish were put onto hooks to see if if you do a, um, a cast where you close the bail and you kind of catapult them into the lake. We've all done that, you know. Do they survive their abdomens being ripped like that? Uh, and the, the, the story of that is, yes, they absolutely do. They can lay eggs mm -hmm. after that. Um, they can have a third of their bodies ripped off by a, by a fish. 
They can have their legs and claws ripped off, and they live. So, you know, these, these things are tough, and there's plenty of watersheds where you can, you know, proof, if you want to see this in action, go to the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, because uh, um, the rusty crayfish has been introduced there, and the, the, the benthic community near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, it's just been annihilated by these crayfish. There are quite literally what would likely equate to tons of rusty crayfish, and it's just completely shifted the ecology of that street. Um, and that's the direct result of bait boxing. So at the end of the day, what I tell everybody is, especially if you're buying the crayfish, and I do not recommend that, but if you're going to, you know, I get it, just don't let them go. You know, it's, put them on the deck of your boat. Think about someone you don't like and I'll turn them into pace. Like, just <laughs> do not put them in the water box. You are not doing anybody any favors if you just, you know, you feel bad for the crayfish at the end of the day and you let it go. So, so are, obviously there's like the duh moment of like, yeah, you shouldn't go down to Louisiana and take the toughest crawdad in the world and bring it to somewhere, you know, where it's not native. But is there any danger? So like around here in, in Dayton, Ohio, we have five rivers that are all probably within, you know, 10 minutes of each other. Is there any chance of taking a crayfish from one river that's that close to a different river and introducing it and having any cross contamination? Or is it like, hey, you're all in this, you know, Miami Valley here, you're all close enough in geography that that's not going to be an issue? Or could it literally be taking a crawdad from a river, putting it in a pond, and that could be detrimental? How how touchy is it? Pond is different, but if, if you go, like if you're in the Miami River watershed, and you go from one stream to another, you drive up over the ridge or the drainage divide, absolutely horrible. That's like <laughs> me as the crayfish guy does a full body cringe. Just if you're going to fish in one stream, get the crawdads out of that stream. And it very well could be invasive. Like where you are, this has actually happened. Um, the rusty crayfish is taking out a crayfish there that's known as Sloan's crayfish. And it's, it's, it's bait endangered in Ohio because of bait bucket introduction. Um, and another thing that we can address real quick. Because I, I have heard, I've, I've been on the stream bank and been confronted with this question, uh, which is, well, you know, a crawdad is a crawdad. Who the hell cares? There have been plenty of studies that show that that is not a true statement. Uh, when, when you introduce these invasive crayfish or introduce crayfish to a new watershed, those species that, are, uh, that cause these deleterious effects they are very different behaviorally. They are very different, what we call trophically, which means what they're feeding on and eating. And you could, in theory, take a crayfish and introduce it to another watershed, and it might be a weak species of crayfish, and it's just going to die. But we just don't want to risk it because the ecological impact can be so extreme that it's just not worth risking it. So... If you're fishing in a watershed, in a river, not even, I shouldn't say watershed. If you're fishing in a stream, get the crayfish from that stream. It's just that simple. Got it. And for, for us fish guys, it's probably easier to think of in terms of like, we have invasive fish that we're all freaking yeah. out about. You have like your, you know, your Asian carp or the silver carp, whatever yeah. ones that are on the, you know, the uh, Mississippi River flying up and hitting dudes in the face because there's millions of them. It's like, that's probably what's happening to the crayfish. They're just subsurface and we don't interact with them as much. So we don't see the results of it. That, that is one hunt that absolutely you know, getting hit in the head by a 20 pound big metal carp that could get your attention. Um, but when you go to your local lake and you can't catch bass anymore, that gets your attention too. And that, and you know, there are absolutely places where this is happening. So there you go. So let's talk colors. Um, yep. colors is one of those things I feel like I'm probably misinformed on and I probably know a lot of wives tales about the colors of crawfish that probably aren't true. Um, but I know even around here, we get a rainbow of colors of crawfish around here that all out of the same river. So I have to assume uh, just an educated guess. It's species, molting, mating, temperature. I'm sure all that stuff kind of plays a part in color of those craws. But can you, I guess, kind of uh, give us a quick rundown of why there are craws different colors? Is there any method to the madness of why there are colors certain times of year? Or, you know, in the fall, do you typically see more burnt orange and red versus a different time of year you see darker colors or anything like that? Is there any sort of method to the madness there? There is some method to the madness. Uh, with with crayfish, 
there is some evidence now that the color, like I said earlier, I think color patterns may be used in species recognition. So uh, crayfish can see, obviously they've got eyes, uh, but they're, they're, we don't really have a true understanding of how good their vision is. But what we do know is they recognize contrasting patterns. So if you look at a crawdad, a lot of times there is this groove that's right in the middle of that carapace part. So you got the tail, that's the part that you would eat if you're eating a crawdad, and you got that head part that all the legs and the antennae and all that kind of come out. That We refer to that as the carapace in crayfish land. So running right up the middle of that is this groove called the cervical groove, and there's a lot of species of crayfish that will have dark coloration along that groove, and then in front of it and behind it, there'll be the same light color or one species might have a like gray and then the other species has blue behind a black band around that that groove and if you're a fish this when they become familiar with the local crayfish in their stream it, it's reasonable to assume that they're able to kind of hone in that that contrasting pattern equals this thing that i can eat so that's important i would say for ang anglers one thing that a lot of people don't realize is when the crayfish is molt and that exoskeleton becomes hardened there is a plethora of, of organisms that will grow on that carapace so it's called biofouling and basically it'll get covered in brown algae and, and uh, protozoa and fungi like all kinds of crazy stuff paraphyton and that will actually obscure that color pattern so uh i do a lot of work in southern west virginia where there's a lot of impacts to the streams from coal mining and there's manganese down there. And when I go down there, a lot of the, the fishermen that we bump into inevitably when we're in a creek are like, well, what's the black one? Well, in that situation, there is no black crayfish. That's an example of this fouling where they're in water that has manganese in it. And basically the manganese hits their exoskeleton and gets deposited and it makes them all black. So I've had a lot of people, especially here in Appalachia, be like, well, what's the red one? We actually don't have any red ones. What that is, is that's iron deposition on the exoskeleton of the crawdad. And it doesn't matter if it's what genus, all of them are going to turn red inevitably until they molt. And then they molt and you get that fresh color pattern back again. And, and it seems like there's multiple species when in reality it's the same species. So you also have this biofouling effect. Um, but as a general rule, you're going to have uh, the, the prettiest crayfish are going to be present or that not necessarily the prettiest, but the crayfish that have their natural patterns, that natural pattern can be present in the early to mid spring and then summer ish, end of summer, mid summer, when these molting events are happening. Because as soon as they molt, they lose all that biofouling um, and they go back to their normal pattern. Another thing that happens with crawdads is their diet does impact how colorful they are. They, like a lot of animals, eat plants, and plants have these things in them called carotenoids, that's where the word carrot comes from. And carotenoids are reds and browns and oranges. And if they have a lot of carotenoids in their diet, they will be kind of vibrant in their coloration. If they're denied carotenoids, they will oftentimes turn blue. So you can have any species of crayfish can have a blue morph. Uh, that's why they're so prevalent in the pet trade right now. You can go to Petco and buy an electric blue lobster for like $85. It's the exact same crawdad that you buy at the fish market, and you're going to eat it. It's just the, a, a, a species. Sorry, it's a genetic mutation that makes it blue, like an albino. Um, so blue patterns are something that's kind of unique to crawdads, and that's why we have so many that are bluish, blue, purplish, blue green, aqua. You know, those are colors that are real common with crayfishes because they kind of lean that way, especially if carotenoids are denied from their diet. So you're you're telling me that I was looking for an easy answer there of like uh, for me as an angler to say oh yeah in the in the fall they turn you know uh, orangish brown and stuff you're telling me to sack up and go to my local uh, creek and river and figure out what color they are because the ones in the headwaters of the of the river could be different than the ones at the bottom depending on exactly. their food sources depending on what uh, what you know, their carotenoids and what they have and stuff like that there's no easy formula or common knowledge to say hey this is what color they're going be this time of year in this location i don't think so uh <laughs> interesting yeah the, the, Darn um, it. <laughs> if i were fishing a crawdad pattern wanting a bass to hit it i would fish a lure that had a lot of contrast to it so i wouldn't necessarily throw something that was like chartreuse or brown 
but maybe something that has a saddle in the middle of it, like a black band, or that's a light brown with a black band. Because what that's going to do is that's going to almost that's going to imitate that group of crayfishes that is always going to be predated on by bass. And the bass in that situation are going to see the contrast, think it might be that species, and then hit it. So that's what I would So there's a reason that a black and blue jig is probably the most popular jig color of all time. There is some exactly. biology to that. A total biology to that. 100%. Mm -hmm. So then what about the flip side? What about you said, obviously, like candy to bass is a freshly molted crawl, a crawl that is defenseless. What color is that crawl naturally? Is that kind of a just gross, light colored crawl? And if so, then obviously the, the contrast thing goes out the window, but you know, uh, scent maybe becomes a little bit more important. Uh, have they found a way to bottle that, uh, <laughs> that freshly molted crawl <laughs> scent just yet? People have said they, they have, well, actually there is a chemical derivative that is, uh, that has been kind of I don't know how to say this properly. There's a, 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 a chemical that almost all crustaceans produce when they're molting and you can purchase that, but we're talking like you got to get it from a biological supply chain, not necessarily Bass Pro. So this isn't the Jack's juice yeah. spray that we're using. No, got it. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that. Um, but, but no, the, the fish do cue, cue into that. In fact, anything that's eating a soft shell craw is going to eat that. And most soft shell, crayfish when they mold are deaf their colors are absolutely muted and part of the reason why is when they shed that exoskeleton a lot of the carotenoids you've been talking about are, are released in the exoskeleton so when they start to basically feed again once they are their exoskeletons hard enough um that's when they get their carotenoids back and they will become brighter and brighter and brighter as they feed post molting got it so one of the last things I wanted to talk about here is behavior. First off, their movement. I think we've all seen crawls swim before, and when they are fleeing or when they're escaping something, you know, whether it's really fast or really slow, they have this kind of pumping action to them because obviously yep. their tail's propelling them. Um, do you ever see any sort of motion that's not got that pump to it from a crawl? Uh, they will do a very slow and deliberate walk across the bottom of a stream. Okay. Uh, that that kind of swimming backwards with their tail is always associated with the startle response or fear. So they're basically like, oh, hell no, I need to get the hell out of here. And that's why they're moving like that. Uh, but they will do a somewhat deliberate kind of prowling walk up through the stream bed. And when they do that, they're going to be walking through those interstitial spaces. So if you were to do a, a, an action on the, on the river bottom, that's going to be like that. And then every now and then jig, what they will do is if they bounce into something and they get a chemical cue that they don't like, they'll do a real quick flip of their abdomen up into the water column and then kind of slowly come back down with their claws out to face whatever the hell they just bumped into. And I imagine that that action, if they happen to be doing that near a small mouth, the small mouth is going to destroy them. So uh, that that's definitely something that I would say that would be worth pursuing and another thing is uh we like i said er earlier we put radio transmitters on the big burly crayfish canberras and a lot of people were like why the hell are you doing that these things live under rocks everybody knows that they find a rock they live under it they die we're done that is not what they do uh these animals about an hour after dark not uh, not all of them but a portion of the population they go on these nightly strolls and if you go out at night with a flashlight looking look at the river, you'll see crayfish moving around. Everybody knows that. But the distance they're moving is crazy. Some of these critters in a night are moving 100 meters, 200 meters upstream. I did a study in West Virginia in, the, um, in this wonderful place called Anthony Creek, part of the Greenbrier River watershed, which is arguably the best river system in, in the state. And we were studying those invasive crayfish, and we wanted to know, like, how far do they move? Because if you know how far they move, you understand the invasion dynamic. So we caught a bunch of really big animals. And these things were pushing nine inches, 10 inches total body length. They were huge. And we glued these transmitters underneath their claws. And then we just basically would find out where they were in the morning, leave them alone all day, let them go at night, and then track them the next morning and then you know, measure the distance. And we had one animal move what equated to three quarters of a mile in five days. So like this is an active animal. So 
They didn't move at all during the day, but as soon as it started to get dark, they're just out cruising around. Uh, so I, I don't think fishermen realize how active they are. This was during the summertime. When the water temperature gets below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, crayfish activity as a general rule tends to just cease. And what those animals are going to be doing is they find rocks, they get up underneath them, and they basically hibernate when the water gets to be that cold. Um, so that's another thing. If you're you know, presenting, I don't know how many fish are active at water temps like that, but if you're presenting a, a lure at, at, at that temp, it could be lucrative because you're going to be imitating the idiot crayfish that doesn't know what the hell's <laughs> going on and just die in the you know, bucket's evolution and be active right now. Uh, but then again, I don't know if the fish are biting at that temperature either. So there's that. But but yeah, they're, the only thing that stops the movement is cold water. That's it. Really cold water. That's always the fun dynamic of trying to understand what we're doing as anglers, because half of your brain says do the most natural thing possible. And the other half of your brain says do the exact opposite of the natural thing. So you look like the dumbest, you know, crawfish or frog yeah. or whatever in the, the water system. So it's one of those things, too, where it's like there's no real right or wrong way to do this. We're always just trying to add more stuff to our tool belt and at least understand why we're choosing to do one or the other. Uh, but one yeah. thing you said is really interesting. I always just assumed that popping a jig was one of those things that we do as anglers because it, it I don't know, it gives us something to do. It pops. You you hopefully get the attention of something, but I never really thought of that as a natural crawl thing to do. It was just more of like, hey, look, I'm oh. here. Give it a pop every once in a while. But you're telling me that a crawfish will be on its strut and, you know, uh, run into a, a rock like it runs into a door at night and just bounce right up. There's way more biology in fishing than anybody knows. <laughs> than we know. That's why as some we of the best it. fishermen I know are biologists. So, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, Last thing, obviously, I wanted to talk about here, and you kind of touched on it a little bit. I have some questions on just the nuances of, of kind of what we have going on around here, but you touched on times of year, on times of year where if, you know, uh, gun to your head, when do you fish a crawl? You you talked about spring. You talked about kind of early summer and uh, when these crawls are a little bit more active and stuff like that. Um, are there, I, I guess, anything... Uh, to say that different times of year, they're a little bit, I'm assuming mating has something to do with this too, but a little bit more likely to venture out into that open water versus staying so reclusive. Like, do they get a little bit more uh, strut your tail feathers during mating season or, yeah. you know, things like that? So there's two times a year where I would argue that the overall population dynamics get a little bit stupid. And what I mean by stupid is that they stop caring as much about being in cover and then they expose themselves to predation. Uh, the f now, this does not work everywhere, but if you're in the mid-Atlantic, most of the Midwest, not all of it, but most of it, and then parts of Appalachia, uh, for that genus Faxonius, which is the genus I keep coming back to that the bass are gonna be feeding a lot on, uh, those animals, their mating season begins late summer and is present throughout most of the fall. And a male crayfish is one of the most sex crazed animals on planet earth. They don't give a crap about anything else, but you know, finding a female. And if they get in the presence of a female, they will oftentimes do some pretty stupid things, expose themselves to predation and then get eaten. So if you're, you know, fishing that time of year, the bass are expecting it. But there's another thing that happens, especially in the mid Atlantic, in, in Appalachia, where you have a resident species of Faxonius, and that is when the young of the year get to be about an inch long and enter the population, uh, it is a it, it is absolute crawdad carnage in the river because <laughs> you have all these dumb baby crayfish that don't have an understanding of anything, and you've got hundreds to thousands of them entering the stream at once. And we did a study in southern West Virginia where we were electrofishing and we were looking at the diet of trout that were being introduced. And we were also looking at smallmouths and rock bass, uh, native fish, because there's a endangered crayfish we do a lot of work with. And the question was posed, if we introduce trout into the waters that have the endangered crayfish, is that going to hurt the endangered crayfish? And so we were comparing these stock fish with native fish, which were the bass. And right when the, the native facts and nice babies started to get big enough for the bass to care about them, the bass diet shifted to almost 100% crayfish. It went from eating whatever they could find, minnows, like the occasional you know, frog, and crawdads. Crawdads were always there. But when those young hit that population, it was crazy 
how many little baby crawdads we were basically we would make the fish regurgitate um called gastric lavage and you know you have a decent molly they might have 10 to 20 of these crayfish in there there were there were animals where we caught them and the, and the, the students were like these things are gravid they're pregnant they weren't pregnant they just eat so many freaking crawdads that they were swollen uh and so that time of year right now actually is that time of year um they just become like the dominant forage but it takes the right river system it takes the right population dynamics but if you have that they will absolutely be the golden bait because <laughs> you know that, that's just the way it's going to go down so interesting and my very very last question here is a selfish one for me because i am in a giant bowl where we have five rivers and a very low uh watershed here where we just blow out and flooding happens all the time and it's it's like you know, most people probably freak out if they saw the flooding we have around here, but it just happens every month or so. Um, but what does that do to cross? Because obviously when you walk the bank after one of these big flood events, there are, I mean, it's it's a, a war zone of just dead crawls everywhere. And does that do anything to the crawl behavior, population, when, when that current is so bad and it's just a, a you know, up 10 foot type of flood, do those crawls just hunker down and not go anywhere? Or do they get swept all over the place and kind of become uh, easy targets as well? I think it depends on where, where you are in the country. So if you're in an area where you have like classic river systems, like here in West Virginia or you in Ohio, the crayfish seem to do to, to hunker down. They'll basically get you know, underneath some kind of substrate debris and then hope for the best. And what they will also do though, is they will move along the water's edge. So they'll, in response to flooding, and we, we actually did this with those animals that had radio transmitters. We kind of, we had a couple flood events happen and we were like, all right, let's go see what they're doing. And in that situation, what they did is they actually moved with the floodwaters out to the edge. And basically, they were staying in that kind of slow-moving bank water, for lack of a better word. Uh, I got another great example of them doing that. So we had my lab and I had a project in um, Big Thicket National Preserve, which is in East Texas. And we went down, and uh, that was in 2014. And the Trinity River was experienced, and the Neches River were getting like 100-year flood. I mean, it was insane. The interstates were getting obliterated by the rivers i mean and i went down there and was like what the hell am i doing here there's so much water we're not going to catch a crawdad they can be anywhere and we actually caught more crayfish on that trip than any collecting trip i've ever been a part of because we figured out that oh the crayfish are just following the edge of the water so what would happen is we would you know took us a while to figure out where the edge of the river was because the trinity river during that time became a lake i mean it was it was crazy but when we finally were able to figure out oh it's you know it's a mile that way um because the river was miles out of its bank not just you know it's right there but we would find that edge and we would grab dip net and just basically jab the dip net through what equated to yards and grasses and fields the crayfish were right there and we actually caught tons of them so they do respond to that the big thing that happens a lot of time with floodwaters which we don't think about is when you get a lot of floodwaters and a lot of sediment in the water and it's warm, the amount of oxygen in the, in the water can actually drop precipitously. And these animals need air just like we do. And the neat thing about crayfish is that they can breathe out of water. As long as their gills are wet, they can grab oxygen out of the air and it can, can go through water and pass through their gill membranes and get into their body. And a lot of times what will happen when you get those big flood events, you have things like burrowing crayfish, which are mud bugs. They make the chimneys along rivers and streams, you, you go in after one of these great big hundred year uh, flood events and you'll see just dead crayfish everywhere. And those animals have actually asphyxiated in their tunnel because this deoxygenated water takes out their burrows and they can't, they can't get to the surface to breathe. So it, you know, there's a biological response. So if you get a flood event, the crawdads are going to be right up at the edge. Now, this is also what can oftentimes cause invasions because if you get if you have a stream or river that, that you know, gets out of its banks and spills into the, the river next door, crayfishes are going to be following along that high water mark. They're going to ultimately make their way into the next river and you have a new invasion. And there's, that has been documented. So. Yeah. yeah. At least that's an invasion, though, that we didn't yeah, that's create. That's one that goes so. beyond. 
<laughs> yeah. So, it's been happening for millions of years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. Before we let you go, too, if anybody's listening to this and they have their interest peaked on crayfish and they want to kind of seek out some more information on crayfish, is there anywhere you would direct folks to say, hey, here's some good sources to kind of do some reading up on? Um, oh, there's, there's so many, <laughs> but there's not that many at the same time. So one way to figure out what crayfish live in your area, uh, if you want to get a pattern, is you can actually use this app called iNaturalist. And if you type into iNaturalist crayfish, it will show you all the crayfish records from around you, and there'll be pictures of the crayfish. And at that point in time, you don't even necessarily have to identify them. If you just want to match a pattern to what's there, you can hit the picture, see what crawdad was caught there, and then try to match its pattern, you know, the old fashioned way. So that's one one thing to do. There's plenty of um, internet resources that are available. There's lots of information about these invasive crayfishes. I would say it's real important for you as a as an angler to learn what they look like and make sure that you're not spreading them. That's important. And then you can always use my lab. Uh, my lab's available. We have a, a Facebook page, a Lofman Lab, the West Liberty University Crayfish Conservation Lab. All of that you can type in Lofman Lab to Facebook. It normally pops up. Uh, and we get people messaging us all the time. I've got an army of grad students who look at that page. So if we have a question, we can answer it there. And then you can use me. I, you know, my, my profession is teaching, so I don't mind talking about this stuff at all. So you can find me on Facebook. I'm Zach Lofman on Facebook. And then on Instagram, my handle is Dr. Crawdad. So if you go there, you can find me there as well and just shoot me a DM or a PM and you know, we go from there. So just, I'm an extremely busy guy. Don't get pissed. If I don't respond to you, like in an hour, it might take me a day or two. When we're doing field work in Southern West Virginia, a lot of times we don't have Wi-Fi for like days. So just, you know, know that, but I do make a, I, I absolutely try to get a hold of everybody that reaches out. Well, thank you so much. This has been a super, super enjoyable conversation. I know the people are going to love this. Um, oh, so yeah, if there's anything you know we can help with too, obviously let us know. But that is our conversation with Dr. Zach Lofman. Zach, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to episode two of The Bait Breakdown, the crawfish episode with Dr. Zach Lofman. Get ready. Next week on episode three, we have a really cool conversation about aquatic insects with Dr. Sally Entrican. But as always, thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please head over to Apple. Leave us a review. That helps a ton. Go subscribe on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you listen, and we will see you back here next week for episode three of The Bait Breakdown here on the Tackle Talk podcast. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.